the emergence of the common law system. In the Anglo-Saxon period, the Christian kings issued their law codes with the advice and counsel of the Witan, consisting of the bishops and other ecclesiastics, elder men and thanes. And, as we have seen, the content of these law codes, as time passed, became increasingly occupied with Christian and church matters. Furthermore, there was not at this time the same degree of separation between church and state characteristic of later periods. The kings acted in council with their bishops and legislated as Christians. Convinced of their duty to honour God by establishing justice and protecting the church, they were also aware, since the church was continually reminding them, of the fact that God blesses obedience and judges the disobedience in history and therefore that their standing before God was of the greatest importance for the stability of their reign, for the peace and prosperity of their kingdom and for success in war. The Old Testament King David was the great model for them as Christian kings, and the church actively encouraged such analogies with scripture. No doubt this is why the historian and professor of medieval history, H.R. Loin, could use the word theocracy of the late Anglo-Saxon period. Kingship was in a very real sense a Christian ministry for the Anglo-Saxon kings. They were, in a sense, officers of the church, indeed, heads of the church. Church and state were one, and, as Loin writes, the lordship of the king and of Christ lay over the land and the people. Not until the Gregorian reform and investiture struggle, late 11th and 12th centuries, did this begin to change and the church to assert her independence. In the post-Norman conquest period, there was a separation between the church and state, and the law as a discipline or science achieved a status to some extent independent of either. Of course, common law arose out of the administration of justice by royal courts with jurisdiction over the whole country, and canon law was the domain of the church. But, as Berman writes, in the wake of the papal revolution, there emerged a new system of canon law and new secular systems together with a class of professional lawyers and judges, hierarchies of courts, law schools, law treaties, and a concept of law as an autonomous, integrated, developing body of principle and procedures. Berman is here writing of Europe generally, and of course Roman law did not have the influence in England that it had on the continent. Nonetheless, the general characteristics of his description are applicable to England also. By the early 14th century, the English common law system was independent of the King's Council and had its own judges, records, literature and professional lawyers. After invading England, William I was king to make good his claim to be king by lawful right, that is, as the nominated successor of Edward the Confessor, as well as by conquest. He therefore promised that the English laws would remain in force. In fact, the Normans were, writes J. H. Baker, warlike, uncultured and illiterate. Whether they appreciated or not, they found in England a system of law and government as well developed as anything they had left in Normandy. Certainly they had nothing of refined jurisprudence to transplant. The initial effects of the Norman invasion were rather backwards. They introduced a new racial discrimination, this time between the French and English, a new and rather barbaric form of ordeal, trial by battle, the separation of ecclesiastical courts from the shires and hundreds, the subjection of the forests to an alien and oppressive forest law, protecting the royal hunt, and a brand of military feudalism, which gave seigneurial jurisdiction a new basis. None of this helped produce the common law, rather the reverse. England, however, was a unified nation with a central government, represented by sheriffs who were responsible to the king, and the beginnings of a bureaucracy operating through writs, written instructions from the king. There were, however, significant differences of law and custom between the three main areas of the country corresponding to the old English kingdoms of Wessex, Mercia and Dane law. Without a strong centralised bureaucracy, the unification of English law into a system of common law could not have been accomplished, and it has been speculated that without that unified system, Roman law 
would most likely have triumphed eventually in England, as it did in Europe. The contribution that the Normans made to the emergence of English common law was their ability in government and administration, since they greatly strengthened and developed England's incipient central government. The common law emerged in the 12th century from the efficient and rapid expansion of institutions which existed in an undeveloped state before 1066. Over the two centuries following the Norman conquest, the Norman and Angevin kings took control of the administration of justice throughout England by creating a system of royal courts. The supremacy of the royal courts was achieved largely as a result of transferring the jurisdiction of the local and feudal courts to the king's justices and the royal courts. Gradually, the local courts declined in importance as the common law courts became more popular and more important. This process was further reinforced by the Statute of Gloucester in 1278, which stated that no actions involving less than 40 shillings were to be tried in a royal court, but which was interpreted by the common law judges as meaning that no action involving more than 40 shillings was to be tried in a local court. As a result, the Shire and Hundred Courts declined even further and the common law courts became the chief courts of the nation. Although, in one sense, the common law was the creation of the royal judges in and after the 12th century and was the law which they applied uniformly throughout the realm, it would be wrong to think of the common law as in any way a new or alien law transplanted into England by the Normans It was not. As we have seen, William promised the English that their laws would not be overturned. The Normans did not bring a body of laws with them to impose upon England. Indeed, they had no written law to bring with them. William himself confirmed, with some additions and amendments, the old laws of England current in Edward the Confessor's reign. In order to secure the papal blessing on his expedition, he did, however, promise to separate the ecclesiastical jurisdiction from the shire and hundred courts. The church and lay jurisdictions, which were inextricably bound together under the Anglo-Saxon kings, have remained separate ever since. The common law, however, emerged from a process in which, although many of the old laws and customs of England dating from before 1066 were abandoned, many more were preserved. To these, new precedents and principles were added as the body of law common to the whole realm was built up. The common law that resulted from this process was not simply a mixture of old English law and custom and Norman government and administration. These were, of course, important elements and factors in the emergence of the common law. But the Norman conquest created a new situation in England that had profound effects in English society. Hardly have Normans and Englishmen been brought into contact before Norman barons rebel against their Norman lord and the divergence between the interests of the king and the interests of the nobles becomes as potent a cause of legal phenomena as any old English or Frankish traditions can be. English common law emerged from a new and changing society and addressed and was shaped to meet the needs of that society. Consequently, although much of the old English law and custom was retained, much was also transformed or became obsolete, since, as Berman writes, In contrast, not only to the earlier Western folklore, but also to Roman law both before and after Justinian, law in the West in the late 11th and 12th centuries, and thereafter, was conceived to be an organically developing system, an ongoing, growing body of principles and procedures, constructed, like the cathedrals, over generations and centuries. A good indication of the state of English law in the century following the Norman Conquest is given us by a number of Norman law books written in the early 12th century. These law books demonstrate the endurance of many old English laws dating from pre-Norman times, the most significant of which were the laws of Alfred and Knut. They purport to give us the law that was current in the reign of Edward the Confessor, but they state it in a modernised and amended version. This is English law made practicable for life in the Norman period. There are four such books of the Liber Quadripartitis, written between 1113 and 1118. The last two books are lost. The first book 
is a translation into Latin of the Code of Knut and Old English Dooms, going back to Alfred. The second book contains the coronation charter of Henry I and other state papers. The Leges Henrique, written sometime before 1118, is a more important document. It contains the coronation oath of Henry I and states the laws of England as they existed in an amended form in the reign of William I and Henry I. The author took much of his material from the laws of Knut and the older English dooms, and he may have relied on the Liber Quadripartitus. The author also made use of some passages from foreign law codes. The old differences between Wessex, Mercia and Dean law in matters of law and custom still survived at this time, but, right Pollock and Maitland, the author of the Legis Henrique is, in some sort, the champion of West Saxon, or rather Wessex law. Wessex is, in his opinion, the head of the realm, and in doubtful cases, Wessex law should prevail. The Leis Williame purports to set down the laws of Edward the Confessor's Day, which were granted to the people of England by William I. The book is in three parts. The first part contains rules of Old English law as understood in Norman times, with some Norman additions. According to Pollock and Maitland, this harmonises well with the ancient dooms. The second part contains some writings that show the influence of Roman law, and the third part consists of translations of parts of Canute's laws. The Leges Edwardi Confessoris claims to set down the laws of Edward the Confessor, as stated in the fourth year of William I's reign but its contents describe the reign of William Rufus and, according to Pollock and Maitland, who describe it as a private work of a bad and untrustworthy kind, was probably written late in Henry I's reign. Besides these four books, there are two translations into Latin of Knut's Dooms that borrow from Anglo-Saxon documents that are lost to us. The picture that these Norman law books give us is that of an ancient system struggling to adapt itself to new conditions. The old dooms are virtually the only written law available. Much of the law is embodied in local custom, but the rules differ between those areas corresponding to Old Wessex, Mercia and Dane law. The law deals mainly with restitution or compensation for crimes, but the criminal tariff has become exceedingly complex and is breaking down under its own weight. This confused situation was resolved, eventually, by the development of a centralised royal administration of justice under royal courts and royal justices, who evolved out of this jumble of laws a unified body of law applicable across the whole realm. These were, therefore, three important factors in the emergence of English common law. First, the old English pre-Norman customs and laws, which were permitted to remain in force, but in fact many of which were either transformed and amended to meet the needs of a changing society, or else became obsolete. Second, the new social conditions created by the Norman presence. And third, the burgeoning centralised administration of royal justice. These three elements created the cultural matrix out of which the common law emerged.